Good morning. I know every day is a special day, but for all the moms, it is a special day. I know sometimes moms don't feel like they get enough recognition for the work they do, but I know they're going to get it today. And obviously, I am very thankful for mothers because I wouldn't be here without my mom. And, you know, I do think about how far back motherhood goes, and it goes back to the beginning. Same with fatherhood. It's something that is rooted within our structure, within our DNA. We have to have a mom, we need to have, and have to have a dad. But today we're talking about mothers. And last year, Mother's Day caught me off guard, and I didn't have a lesson. And this morning, uh, I would like to look over a particular woman that I, I do not believe I've ever heard included in a Mother's Day lesson or a Mother's Day study, or actually really talked about it all. Because the situation that surrounds this woman is what's focused on and not the woman herself. And so we're going to start here in Matthew, the 20th chapter, Matthew chapter 20. I've always been inspired, kind of the same lines of what uh, Brother Ron said this morning. I've been inspired by women a lot of, you know, my life. As I was growing up and we'd have all these ball camps, we'd have all these soccer games, there was always the moms there. You don't, you didn't really hear of soccer dads back then. You hear of it now, but you didn't hear it back then. It was soccer moms. Because a lot of the times that's, who was there was the moms. Normally the dad was either working late or they were getting home from working, but there's always the soccer moms. Well, I had a good friend and his mom would go out of her way to make sure that everyone on the basketball team was taken care of, whether it was buying shoes, whether it was buying socks, and you can just think on how expensive that would get. And then you'd have to think, we would go over to his house because he was a lot more wealthier than we were, and he had ping pong table, pool table, so we all went to his house to hang out. Well, could you imagine about eight 16-year-old boys going to a house, how much food we would eat, and how much we would drink? So you could imagine, but she put up with us. She loved us like we were her own children, and I look at her just like another mom in my life. So there's been a lot of women I know that's, in, that's impacted the way I am today. And so this particular woman, I don't believe we have a name for her in Scripture. I didn't really look up what the name may be. I know it could be different if I started outsourcing. But they are James and John's mom, mother. And we find here in Matthew chapter 20, we find a conversation that she had with Christ, and Christ would therefore have a conversation with the disciples based on what the mother here is saying. And so in Matthew chapter 20, in verse 20, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons. So, you know, I kind of think about how a mom, you know, she's like the mama bear and, and the kids are the cubs. It's when wherever that the mom goes, a lot of times the children are right there. My wife gets up just to go do something real quick. Guess who's following her right at the auditorium? My little kid. Doesn't matter if I say to sit, they're going right after her. It's, it's part of their life. She's the one that, that they are with more often than me. And that may have been the case with um, the mother here of uh, James and, and John. And so she brought her sons with him to go see Christ. And right off the bat, I learned something about this woman. This woman believed in Jesus. It wasn't just a, let me see if I can put on a show here. This woman believed in Jesus. She believed in who he was. And at this time, there was not a lot of believers in Jesus. There was not a lot of people that would stand up for Jesus. But right off the bat, I've learned that this woman believed in Jesus. And she brought her sons with him. And she knelt down. And we know what that means. What a sign of respect. What a sign of submission towards Jesus. And that's not the only thing that gives it away. 
So let's, let's keep reading. And asking something from him, and he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left. Now, that seems great, high and mighty of her sons, and we'll get to that portion in a minute. But look at the last phrase of this verse. In your kingdom. This is what gives it really away. She recognized that this was not the Father's kingdom. It was not the Holy Spirit's kingdom. It was the kingdom that belonged to Christ. And during this time, this is a great statement to make from a, we'll call them a civilian's point of view, just a normal Jewish person's point of view to say that the kingdom is Jesus' kingdom. Not just God's kingdom, not just the Spirit's kingdom, but Jesus. This is your kingdom. Now this wording should sound familiar. Turn to the book of Luke chapter 23. Some of you probably know where I'm going with this. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23 and we'll be looking at verse 42. This is the the thief, the criminal on the cross, whatever you'd like to call him. Look Look at the knowledge he had. Look at the understanding that this one that people may look down on, he had understanding better than that of the Romans, Roman guards, better than that of majority of the people that were in the attendance of the crucifixion of Jesus. Look at the thief on the cross. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, there's one uh, acknowledgement already, calling him Lord. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he knows that when Jesus dies, because obviously Jesus is going to die, he knows that he's going to have what? Some type of recollection, some type of remembrance. He's going to be alive after he dies. And he says what? Your kingdom. Did the thief on the cross believe in Jesus? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. And that's the same wording here that the mother uses. Can my sons sit one on your left one on your right, and your kingdom. So this mother, right off the bat, she believes in Jesus. Now, you may think that she thinks her sons are all high and mighty, but would you not want the same for yours? Do you not want the absolute best for your kids? The absolute best. And when... Whatever it is comes short of absolute best, doesn't it kind of just tear you up inside? Kind of upset you? It's your kids. I value my kids more than any human being on the planet. And you've heard me make statements before, and they're true statements. It's something I wouldn't lie about, and I don't know how to look at it any, any way else. And the same with my wife. I know that her children are the most valuable thing to her in the life that she has. And, you know, motherhood is something that I didn't truly understand. Obviously, I will never truly understand. Uh, It doesn't matter really what I do to myself. I cannot understand it because I will never be a mom. I'll never be a mother. But I'm a father, so I understand fatherhood. But I was raised up, obviously, by a mom, by mother figures, And I was always on the receiving end of those blessings. And when you watch a mom that loves their kids, that really want to tend to their kids, you see this different kind of love. I mean, it's still love, but just the way they go about it. You see the discipline on how they, you see all these areas, the way the mom deals with her children. And a lot of it's different from how the dad would deal with their children. Why? Because it's another example that we are two separate human beings. <laughs> we deal with things differently. But I was always on this receiving end of motherhood. Now I get to witness it more firsthand through my wife. I get to see really what it takes to be a mom. My wife gets to see what it takes to be a, a father. It's, it's obviously different jobs, but to actually witness it is different. You know, just like witnessing the birth of children. Oh, you could watch a video, you could read a book, but watching it, different story. Actually going through it, different story. You know, we have different perspective depending on where you're at, you are at in your life. And I look at moms now completely different. There, I have definitely a higher respect for mothers uh, and, and 
now since I get to witness it through a different uh, set of eyes. And so when I'm thinking about the mother here, I don't look at her as trying to say my sons are better than anybody. She just wants the best. And what better position do you get than the right side and the left side of Jesus? <laughs> and so with this comment, what does Jesus say? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Turn to 2 Timothy real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 1. We are given insight about Timothy, and I made this comment a couple, maybe a, either it was a Wednesday or a Sunday ago, about Timothy and about his grandmother and his mother. And you may think, well, I'm not getting through. Now, I know I'm talking to some of you saying, Evan, my kids are grown. I got grandchildren. Okay, well, be an influence to your children still. Because there's not a time that will go by in your life that your kids are not your kids. They'll always be your kids. But now you got grandbabies, or some of you are hoping, cheering that you'll have grandbabies. Okay, well, are you still going to play a role in that grandbaby's life? Absolutely. Because depending on how your child is, they still want to go out on all these dates. They still want to live their life. And so a lot of times grandparents end up doing what? raising their kids it happens a lot me and my wife don't get to do that we don't have these special date nights we we try a lot of times we have mr azariah tagging along now he's to the age we can finally leave him and feel comfortable but i know some of my friends that their mom and dads watch their kids 80 percent of the week you know I don't feel that that's right. I don't think it's biblically right. But the grandparents may be put in a position to have that type of influence. And I know it's not wrong because of here. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5, Paul is giving praise to the grandmother and mother of Timothy. When I call you to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. Now that's a great praise. Not just faith, genuine faith. It is Timothy's faith. It is nobody else's. But look where his faith is rooted in. It says, That is in you which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded it is in you too. So does a mother and grandmother play a vital role in the faith of the children? Absolutely. Absolutely. Same with the father and the grandfather. So if you feel as a grandparent from time to time, well, I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't say that. I should, you may need to do that. Because it could be that, and this is not trying to point any fingers at anybody or try to be mean. Some of you may say, my children didn't turn out the way I desired them to. That happens. I mean, I, I'm not, obviously not going to say if you're a Christian parent, the rest of your generation is going to be faithful Christians. I can't, I can't say that. But you may be sitting here thinking, man, I wish I would have done some things different. That's an honest evaluation of yourself. I know here in 30 years and I'm looking back, I'm going to say I wish I would have done something different or some things different because you grow and you learn more about what you should be doing. And you may be able to say, I got grandbabies and I can put that on them. I can help them with things that I've learned and take advantage of it because you're probably going to have a lot of time with them if you're good grandparents. And so back to Matthew, we get to the answer. The answer, it was never answered. Let's put it this way. Jesus never said they will or they won't. But what I read about us going to heaven is that we won't be on the right or the left. We'll be at the foot. That's what I've read in Revelation where they are worshiping at the feet or at the, the throne of God. Now, you don't really, what we know of worship, you don't worship the side of somebody. You don't go up to the king or the queen or, in our case, Jesus and go to his side. Normally, it's at the feet that you show that submission, that respect. And when the mother came to Jesus, she knelt down and it was probably right directly in front of him. Because it wouldn't make sense to go behind somebody and kneel down and worship. <laughs> you know, logically it doesn't make sense, especially in my brain. So what we read most of the time is when God is being worshipped, it's at his feet. 
But he didn't give a no. He didn't give a yes to this woman. What did he say? But Jesus answered and said, do not know, you do not know what you ask. And that's true. She, she doesn't realize what she's asking. If she did, she wouldn't have asked it. Because the only one worthy of being on the right or left side is God. And we're not worthy to be even at the feet, but we are going to one day. Something we should all look forward to, but we're not worthy to be up there near the throne. That's a position that Jesus, how we read, he, in a sense, earned it. <laughs> it's hard to say that, but when he told them all power and all authority is now given to me, that means he didn't have it. And when he went into heaven, he went into that place, it says at that moment, all things were put under his feet. That's the type of person that gets to be in that position. We do not get to be at the throne or on the right or left side. So he says, you don't know what you're asking. He says, are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? So two things, one future, one past. I'm about to drink a cup, and I have already been baptized. It's baptized, I've, baptism I've been baptized with. So it's something that's already been done. Okay, now what's this cup? What is the cup that Jesus was going to drink? First turn to Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. Matthew 26 and verse 39. And it reads... And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. So that's the cup. But what is this cup? What is the cup that Jesus says, Hey, I'm about to drink this cup. Are you going to be able to do the same? So we don't have an answer in the New Testament. Actually, we don't have a clear answer at all. We have speculation. But the speculation we have makes sense. It makes logical sense why this would be the cup. So let's turn back to the Old Testament just for a moment. We'll look in Isaiah and then we'll look in Jeremiah. Uh, we'll turn first to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. There's several different cups. And I, would, I believe that Rick would have went over that with the... Uh, Passover. There was not just one cup on the table. There were several different cups that had several different meanings. And if you study Jewish, uh, the historians, when they were writing about this cup we're about to read about, they were actually having a discussion, a debate, whether or not to include this cup in the Passover meal. Now, what is this cup? Isaiah chapter 51, Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 17. It says, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury, or the cup of his fury wrath now look at verse 22 now it says thus says the lord the lord your god who pleads the cause of his people see i have taken out of your hand the cup of what of trembling the cup of trembling the dregs of the cup of my fury you shall no longer do what you shall no longer drink it now look at jeremiah jeremiah chapter 25 jeremiah the 25th chapter We'll start here in verse 15. Jeremiah chapter 25, and we will start in verse 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine, cup of fury, from my hand, and cause all nations to whom I have sent you to drink it. And they will drink it and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink it to whom the Lord has sent me. So there's this cup in the existence of the Old Testament that was called the cup of fury, the cup of trembling, or the cup of God's wrath. Now this cup, like I mentioned, was debated on whether or not to use in the Passover. And this was after the fact. This was after the death of Christ. Because Jews believe, the Jews that do believe in Christ, and the Jews that do believe in his crucifixion, believe the cup that he said he did not want to drink was this cup. Now, tell me if this makes logical sense. 
you have at the crucifixion of Jesus, you have a moment in time where all of man's sins is in one location. It is on one human being. Now sin equals what? The wrath of God. God is not compassionate to sin. He does not uh, find joy in sin. He does not jump merrily and sing with the angels in heaven when someone sins. What happens with sin? What is it going to suffer? God's wrath. And those who are in sin and die in sin are going to suffer what? God's wrath. He has designed a place that was designed for the devil and his angels, but now is a place of those who will live in sin and choose sin over him will suffer the wrath of God. Now what cup would Jesus not want to drink? Because you have the cups of the Old Testament that represent the passing of the, the dark angel or the archangel or I can't think of the angel's name that passed over and that's why they have the Passover meal the death angel, is that what it was? You have things that represent, the, and they're not bad. They're not something that you would say, I don't want to drink this cup, because these cups that they drank had great things to remember, the things that God done for them. But there's a cup that no one would want to drink, and it's a cup that represents the wrath of God. And so he is telling them, are you ready to drink this cup that I'm about to drink? None of us are. None of us can. That's why Jesus did. We can't drink that cup, not the way Christ did. Christ took all of that wrath that God had towards sin, and he settled the dust on it, the way I look at it. <laughs> it's still there. God is still a God of wrath. Don't get me wrong. He's not some feminine God jumping around joyful all the time. He still gets angry about sin because sin still exists. But when you read that Jesus appeased the wrath of God, that means that he brought that wrath down to a lower step. He caused some appeasement to God's wrath by fulfilling his plan. And he is telling the mother and he's telling the two sons, are you ready? Now, what was their response? Back to Matthew chapter 20, he says, they said to him, uh, we're able. That sounds confident. Now, I don't know if I could say that if I was them in that time, but they had the confidence to say what? I think we're able to do that. I think we're able to drink this cup, and I think we're able to be baptized with the baptism that you were baptized with. Now, we read of that in John chapter 1. John, the first chapter, we read of John the Baptist um, making a remark to this. John chapter 1, and we'll start here in verse 29 of John chapter 1. So, they say we're able. So I, when I'm looking at this, and whether I'm right or wrong, I don't know for sure, but I feel like I'm more right than wrong on this, that the raising of the mother, mother to the, to the child, James and John here, probably gave them this confidence. Because the disciples didn't have much confidence in their walk with Christ. There was many times that these individuals would fall short in doubt. They would be called ones of little faith. But here, while the mother is by their side, they have the confidence to say what? Well, I think we're able to do this. And it may be because of the presence of their mom. The presence, well, you know, in some cases, could be of the father. You can't forget that because when we're reading this, normally we're focused on what? Uh, James and John fighting over who's the greatest. I've never heard anyone discuss the mother in this situation. It's always the response. It's always the chastisement from the other disciples to the two. And you don't read of much of the mother here. But I'm just imagining myself being next to the mom that loves me, that is teaching me, that believes in Jesus. I'm going to be more confident when I'm next to her. I'm more confident when I'm next to you. When we, when we went with Vince over to Jasper, I was very confident to go door knocking in a town I grew up in because there was other Christians doing it. I'm not very confident when I'm by myself. But when their mom is standing there, I think they have the confidence to say, Jesus, I think we can do this. 
they couldn't, but they believed it. The first part, anyway, the, the, the cup. Because they eventually went on and were baptized with a baptism very similar to the, that one of Christ. And this is the baptism here, John chapter 1. And we start here in verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. This is John's recollect, recollection of the baptism that he performed. He says, I saw something like a dove, or descended like a dove, and it was a Spirit, came down, and, and what I like about this section, it says, and remained upon him. You don't read that anywhere else. It remained upon Jesus. It didn't just go, here's a little bit of inspiration, I'm gone. I'm here to stay. This is John's recollection of this uh, baptism. Now, and it says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. That's the baptism of Jesus. And for the first time that I'm aware of, for the first time in earth's history, you have the Godhead in one place. For the first time in earth's history, the Godhead was in one place besides the creation of the world. You go in the Old Testament, you will not find where the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are working in one particular spot. They're all working all right. But this is a special occasion because who cried out from the heavens? The Father. Who was there getting baptized? The Son. And who came upon Jesus? The Spirit. So that's a, this is a grand, glorious event. And he is telling his, the mother and the disciples, are you ready to do this? Are you going to be able to do this? And they said, we able. Now verse 23, back to Matthew 20. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup. This is going to happen. Your confidence is... The, the confidence of you, the confidence of your mom saying, let my sons be here and here, that you're going to drink this cup. You're going to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, but to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give. That's why I said there's not an answer. That's the Father's decision, not his. But it is for those whom is prepared by my Father. Now, when I look at mothers, they're all different. They look different. They act different. They raise different. They discipline different. I had some of my friends that didn't get spankings. <laughs> Lucky you. What my mom did, my mom I don't think ever whooped me, but she could easily say, honey, go whoop the kids. That was her discipline, it was, and, I, and I knew that she would follow through, and he would too. So every parent has a different way of doing things. But I believe all moms and all fathers, but here we're talking about mothers, have the same desire. All good mothers, because I'm not going to deny the fact that they're bad moms and there's bad dads, but all good moms and good dads want the same thing for their kids, to grow up to be a good, moral, respectable human being. And it may not involve Jesus. It may not involve the church. But most people, they desire for their kids to be respectable and to be morally right. But a good Christian mother, a good Christian father, they desire what? That this life will be respectable, they will have good morals, but that they will be Christians. And that they will live their life in such a way that when they pass, they go on to the next. And that they can be, re, re, be reunited, not as mother and children, but as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's the desire of a mother that is in Christ. That's the desire for their children. And so a mother should do anything to protect that, to protect the 
outcome of their children to go to whatever lengths necessary, and this is the same with fathers here, to go whatever extreme it must take for their children to be taught, to be learned of Christ. Now, my, my desire, my wife's desire, if you want to know for my children, something you could guess pretty easy, but one of my main things for my children is I want to preserve their innocence. I want to preserve it. Because the earlier you get, and I know this because of my life, the earlier you get negative thoughts, bad things into a child's mind, the harder it is is going to be to raise them in the church. I can guarantee you that from my own walk of life. Third grade, there were some bad things that were introduced to the boys of my class. We had a man, and this was not out of my mom and dad's control. They couldn't do nothing about it. But I'm just telling you, younger, the worse it is. We had a teacher in our class, and some of you that's been teaching may know this, who got arrested for trying to have sex with underage women. He was our fourth grade teacher. And in class, he would take care of himself in class while we were there. Now, what do you think when some young men see the other side of his computer and see things they're not supposed to see at fourth, third grade? You think that's going to hurt or you think it's going to help? I want to preserve my kids' innocence so that when they grow up, some may think that they're going to be crushed by the world. That's not true because I'm going to train them to know how the world is. Hey, there's people like this. There's people like this. Be prepared that people aren't going to like you. <laughs> they don't have to experience these things themselves. They can be taught these things. And I want them to know from a young age what my desire is for them. So they know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Why they can't go to this place and why they can't go to this place. They're going to know from a young age why I'm doing this. Because I don't want them to think that I want to shelter them or that I, I hate them because they're probably going to say that someday. I hate you. <laughs> you won't let me do nothing. But hopefully they know, hey, dad's trying to do this. Dad has a desire for us. This is my dream. Not saying it's going to come true, but I do believe in the power of scripture. I do believe in the power of a Christian home and Christian family. That it can have an impact on kids. And so this morning as we... We think about, I know uh, Mother's Day, a lot of times, you know, you're going to get pampered, whatever it may be, you're still going to be thinking about your duty as a mom. You're going to be thinking about, like my mom today, it's Mother's Day and she's cooking for everybody. <laughs> you know, on a day like this, it should be the other way around. She should kick her feet back up and watch everybody else do the work, but she's still going to cook. I mean, she's my mom, she's a mom, and it's something that I think that's just built within her. She's going to serve. And that's the last part of Matthew 20, and that's where I want to end. Matthew, the 20th chapter. Turn there real quick or just listen because I kind of made it where you could close your Bibles. <laughs> so you could just listen. And when the ten heard this, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them uh, to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentile lords is over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him do what? Be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him say to your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and to give his lights of ransom for many. I think the greatest thing that we can teach anybody is to have a servant's mentality, to put everyone else and their needs above your own. One of the hardest things to do, but it has the greatest reward. And so this morning I'm going to offer an opportunity as we sing a song to reflect on your life, whether as a mom, whether as a dad, whether as a Christian or not a Christian. And I want you to take advantage of the opportunity to confine yourself into a brother or sister in Christ, that they may pray for you, that they may encourage you to be what you need to be. And if I can do it, be of any help, I will be standing up here. And I hope the song that Dell has will encourage you to make sure that when you leave here that you are right with God. And so let us be an encouragement to you this morning as we come together and sing.